Today we're going to finish the three-part series of, of sermons. Jesus is coming, the great falling away. So Jesus is coming, part three. Let us pray. Holy Heavenly Father, as we hear your word today, may it awaken in our hearts. May it continue to do its mighty work of transforming us into the image of your Son. May it rebuke us if necessary, but always lend our feet on that narrow way that leads into your loving arms and to your heavenly home for all time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so today we're going to talk about the great falling away. This is the last part. First, we talked about the seven signs of Jesus' return. Then we talked about Jesus revealing the process for what's happening in the first and second coming through the marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, through this idea of this marriage ceremony in Galilee. And now we're going to talk about this great falling away because Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 24, and the apostles expanded upon the idea in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Timothy, and 2 Peter. It seems like there's a theme there. And anyway, I just want to comment that the gospel may seem uh, cruel to some people in the world today. It may seem mean-spirited, but nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, I was watching uh, YouTube the other day, just bored and skimming through it, and I saw these two teenagers, and they were exploring this tunnel, which was a, a tunnel for a train. And they were filming themselves, and they were just doing what kids do, and curious as can be, exploring this tunnel. They go through this tunnel, and what do you think happened? A train came. And so uh, they started running for their lives. I tell you what, they were running as fast as they could, and uh, thank God they made it. It reminded me of Stand By Me, that old movie. I don't know if you remember that movie where they jump off the bridge. Well, this was a real thing. And these poor kids, you could see them breathing hard, just looking at each other like, thank God we made it. Well, it's just like that. If you don't share the gospel with someone and you know a train's coming and they're on the train tracks and you don't tell them, look, there's a train coming. Get off the tracks. What's loving about not telling them there's a train coming and that they're in danger? And so... Today's subject may seem hard and it may seem a little scary and, and all of that, but it's so necessary because uh, prophecy is one third of all scripture. And so if we want to get the whole counsel of God, it being one third of all scripture, we have to look into the prophecy. And in fact, there are more prophecies about the second coming of Jesus than the first coming of Jesus. And so if we want to do justice and we want to see the whole counsel of the Word of God, it's something that we have to talk about. And so, uh, the great falling away. First, the gospel will be preached, as Jesus told us in Matthew 24, 14, the gospel will be preached throughout the entire world. And so this great falling away, this great apostasy, has to come when there are a lot of believers on the earth. In fact, today there are 2.5 billion Christians in the world today. Out of 7.8 billion people. And so this gospel has to go out to everyone uh, in giving uh, every country and every types of people an opportunity to know Jesus and to know the gospel and his salvation, the hope. And the invitation he sent out to that marriage supper of the Lamb. And today people are translating Bibles into uh, languages and, and, uh, that have never been translated into before. Missionaries are going out and doing that great work. Sneaking into Bibles, into uh, cut off countries. And so... Satellite has given us the opportunity to share through radio and other media the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. And so the gospel is going out to the world. And that's what has to happen first. And that's what's happening now. Then 
A great apostasy happens. What does that mean? That means that there's a great falling away. People reject the faith. Not just people that have never heard the gospel, but people that are Christians or so-called Christians walk away from the faith. It happens within the church or outside the church. We're not sure. In fact, uh, as we talked about in the first sermon, this is a time of great deception. There's all kinds of people that come uh, uh, saying that they know the way. Follow me. All types of cults and things spring up. But then Jesus talks about the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition. That means the one that's eternally damned. The man of sin, the Antichrist. Now, he's not the devil. He's uh, a man who has all the spirit of the devil dwelling in him. Just as the man of Jesus Christ had God dwelling in him fully. The devil is a great copycat. I don't, he probably never had an original thought in the entire, uh, his entire existence. He copies God. As there is a trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there's an unholy trinity, Satan, the, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. And so, he's a man and he reveals himself during this great falling away. I wonder if he's participating in this great falling away. People see him and they turn to him and reject Christ. And so, his empire that he builds is not just of a military empire, it's one of a theocracy. It's a new religion in which he declares himself God. And as we talked about in our previous sermon, for this to take place, a third temple has to be built. A third temple. The first two were destroyed. One by the Babylonians, the second one by the Romans. A third temple will be built. And when it is built and this great falling away happens, then he reveals himself in the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant would be. And he sits down and declares himself God before all people. Second Thessalonians chronicles this saying, Second Thess Thessalonians chapter 2 <clears throat> <clears throat> now, now we request you, brethren, with regards to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if it was from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come Unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above everything so called God or object of worship. So that he takes his seat in the temple of God displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you I was telling you these things. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains him will do so until it, he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the, by the appearing of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a delusion influencing so that they will believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I tell you what, this there's a lot here, but he's saying 
The apostasy comes first, this great falling away, this great rejection of all of these Christians, whether uh, inside or outside the church, whatever, it, uh, however it comes. Then this man reveals himself and, in the Holy of Holies to be God. And through the power of Satan, he does signs and wonders. I'm sure he'll copycat Christ and people will turn away from Jesus and they will follow him probably because of these signs and wonders. Jesus isn't coming back to walk around the earth again. Jesus is coming back on the clouds. That's why he said, if they say the Messiah is out there in the desert, don't go. If they say there he is in the inner room, don't go. There's going to be mass deception. And in this mass deception, many people will turn away from the faith. Many believers he says that there's a restraining force that's holding him back now. And if it wasn't for that restraining force, he would already be upon us. It would have already come upon us. Who's that restraining force? That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit restraining him and also restraining the hearts of men and, and, giving, and opening them to the idea of God. Giving them opportunity to seek salvation through Jesus Christ and His love and gospel. That's that restraining force. Can you imagine when the Holy Spirit is taken away? Right now, if you look at Myanmar, you look at Africa, you look at China, you look at all the different continents, the Middle East, the tragedies, the abominations, oh, the genocides. That's with the Holy Spirit restraining the hearts of men. Can you imagine what it would be like when the Holy Spirit is taken? What the world would be like when there is no more restraint? I doubt. I pray I'm not alive to see it. Because that's when the depravity of man fully practicing sin. God told us that He desires... Worshippers of spirit and truth. Worshippers that worship Him in spirit and in truth. Just like He told us in John 4 when He saw the woman at the well. And the woman says, Oh, the Jews tell us we got to worship in Jerusalem. Our fathers told us we got to worship on this mountain. He said, Woman, He's foreshadowing the future. A day is coming when men won't worship on that mountain or in Jerusalem, but all over the world. And they'll worship Him in spirit and in truth. To worship God in spirit and in truth. That is a genuine worship with their hearts. A genuine craving with their hearts for God. And yet, in age, at the last days of this age, men will trade their birthright for a bowl of beans like Esau did to his brother Jacob. Your birthright is to be princes and princesses. To be children of the King of God. Christ has made you His brother and His sister with full rights in the Kingdom of Heaven. And yet in those last days, men will trade their birthright for a bowl of beans temporary pleasure for carnal pursuits. 2 Timothy 2 Timothy as Paul <clears throat> tells Timothy he expands upon it to Timothy so that Timothy understands what men will be like in those days. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 through 9 But know this that in the last days, a perilous time will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to their parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, uh, despisers of good, Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. 
having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captive gullible women, loaded down with sin, led away by various lusts, always learning and never being able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. Amen. Jesus, uh, I mean, Paul tells Timothy uh, that difficult times are coming upon them. In these last days, there will be difficult times. Men will be lovers of themselves. Unfortunately, we're on our way there with the selfie generation. It's all about me. The world revolves around me. I have followers on my page. People follow me. I'm an idol. I sing. People worship me for my voice. I have followers. I have a million friends. If you can call them friends. It's all about me. Lovers of self. Self and aggrandizement. People are involved and lost in themselves. They can't see past their own nose. They have tunnel vision. It's all about me. Who cares what's happening to my neighbor? They were out of white bread. I had to eat wheat. He's starving, but I had to eat wheat today. Because it's about me. He said they'd be lovers of money. Jesus told us that it, to the love money is the root of all evil. Not just money is the root of all evil, but to love money is the root of all evil. To love this object, to crave it. People will do anything for it. And so they would sell their best friend for 40 pieces of silver. Boastful, arrogant, revilers. There'll be people that overestimate themselves in these days. They have no accomplishments under their belt, and yet they boast about themselves. They won't listen to wisdom or advice. They're arrogant. Those who use abusive language when is speaking to someone else, those curse words and cursing them with their mouths. That's what a reviler is. They'll be disobedient to the parents. They'll be ungrateful, unholy, and unloving. What a time is that for people to be unloving. They'll be in, irreconcilable, malicious gossips. They will not be able to forgive. They'll be an unforgiving people in that day. They love to spread lies, cause controversies and jealousies and envy. You know, you turn on the TV today and I tell you it's full of that. Those reality shows, malicious gossips. There'll be a people without self-control in those days. People without self-control. They'll be brutal, haters of what is good, treacherous, traitorous, reckless, and conceited. They'll be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Self-indulgence indulgence sums that generation up, that last generation. Self-indulgence, because... Lovers of self and lovers of pleasure. It's all about me, my gratification. The world would stop spinning if I wasn't here. And then he says, they hold to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Those who have a form of godliness are those who make an outward display of religion. They present themselves as godly, but it is all for show. There's no power behind their religion. 
Jesus was no stranger to these. Uh, some of those Pharisees met this perfectly. As evidence in the fact that their lives are unchanged. How can you have the Holy Spirit and not be changed? Yeah, God speaks to me. I have the Holy Spirit, but I'm down doing that same old dirty sin every night. How? How can you live that way? You would be miserable. It would be painful if you had the Holy Spirit to live in that way. Now, I'm not talking about stumbling or falling. I'm talking about habitual sin. How can you live in habitual sin? But these folks will appear to be religious, but live in habitual sin. As evidence in that their lives are unchanged. They speak of God and they live in sin. Someone who has the Holy Spirit, you'll see a difference in their lives. You'll see a change, whether it's incremental in baby steps or this grand sweep and change. I remember when my mother came to the Lord. She was able to give up after 25 years of smoking. She was able to quit smoking. Cold turkey. I was so proud of her. It was amazing. But she did that through the strength that the Lord gave her. And He gives His strength according to each uh, of what we need. I look back on my life and I see the changes that God has made. It's amazing what He does when we allow His Spirit to do its work. Someone who has the Holy Spirit, you can see the difference in their lives. Everyone who thinks, if you talk to anyone on the street, everyone thinks they're a good person because they did it. Well, I do good every now and then. I, I'm not too bad. I'm not as bad as Tom or Gary down the street. I'm not as bad as they are. And every now and then I help someone out. Everyone thinks they're going to heaven. Everyone thinks they're going to heaven, but yet they want nothing to do with God. If you don't want Him here, what in the world makes you think you're going to want Him there? Everyone thinks they're going to heaven, but they want nothing to do with God. They want nothing to do with Christ. They like the idea of the benefits of it, but they don't want Him. If you could have heaven, if you could have heaven, live forever in heaven without God, but you would have all your family, could you still call it heaven without God? I say no. How can we say we have love and yet deny the author of love? That is what these people will be like in those last days. They'll want the blessing. They'll want the good thing. But they won't want God. And so they'll reject Him. God is the author of love. And all of those good things. All those blessings. Who, who would ever give their child... Sacrifice the life of their child for their neighbor. Who among us? Have you ever known someone to give their child for the sake of someone else? Well, yet God did that. He gave His most precious and beloved Son. The thing that meant the most in all the universe for us. How can He convince us any more strongly that He loves us? But people love their sin, and so they reject Him because they don't want to change. They're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And finally, Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, <clears throat> says this, By re recalling what was foretold by the holy prophets, and commanded by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, 
Scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. There that is again. Where is the promise of His coming, they will ask. Ever since our fathers fell asleep, everything continues as it has from the beginning of creation. They will mock the faith and say, where is your Christ? It's been 2,000 years. Where is He? Is He ever coming back? They'll mock and laugh just as they did in Noah's day. All the way up until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came. Just as Jesus told us in that Matthew 24, that people would go on like a day like no other, and then bam, Christ would return and reveal Himself. No one really knows what it's like to serve the Lord these days. To serve a Lord, period. The word has an ancient meaning that is difficult for us in contemporary culture to fully appreciate. We have elected officials that are answerable to us. We pay our taxes and so they better do what we say. Or they should. We have elected officials and others in our society to whom we give authority by our consent. Our consent. So the idea of Lord is something very foreign today for us today. But by contrast, in ancient times, lords had complete <coughs> sovereign control over everything within their territory. They had unhindered sway over everything and everyone under their authority. To acknowledge someone as a Lord meant that you obeyed their ownership and authority over your life without hesitation. In light of history, think about it for a moment. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Really, is Jesus the Lord? Of your life. I confess right now that Jesus is not completely the Lord of my life the way I want him to be and how he should be. There are parts of my heart that I've kept for myself, there are parts of my mind that I've kept for myself, there are parts of my life that I simply are mine. And I struggle to give it over to Him. To give it over to Jesus and His Lordship. I confess that He's far easily, too easily reduced to convenience. Or simply someone to call when we're in trouble. Or if we need someone or something. Or if we get in too deep. Jesus calls us to give our lives over to Him as Lord. He created life. Doesn't it just make sense that we would obey everything He calls us to do? I tell you, the Scriptures tell us that everything was made by Him, for Him, and through Him. He's the author of life itself. God designed life to make sense when we let Him reign in our lives. Thank God that He's perfect in our every weakness and in our stubbornness and in our belligerence and our ignorance. Thank God Jesus is patient with us even in our stubbornness. And continues to call us to give our lives fully over to Him in obedience to Him. Today, may we all have the courage to allow Jesus to truly be the Lord of our lives. To reign in every area of our life. To be invited wherever we are. In our hearts and in our minds. And in the day to day. In the quiet moments 
and our relationships. May Jesus be the Lord of it all. I know these, these things are scary. That these things are, are worrisome. We worry about people in our friends and our family. And yet God loves us. And that's the reason He's late in coming. Because God is willing that not one should perish. That, so, that many more would come to a saving knowledge of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's why He's so long in coming. Because He wants to save more. And I'm sure He's up there before the Father saying, One more, Dad. One more. Let me get one more. Not because He wants to stay away. Or He's waiting for us to be perfect but so that He could save more souls. Amen. That's why He's so long in coming. But He is going to return. And I'm telling you that if there's someone in your family or friend or someone in your circle of influence, share with them the gospel. To them it may seem hate-filled, but I promise you nothing could be more loving to share with them God who loves them, who wants to save them and transform them and give them a hope and a future with Him forever. Not to let them perish, but to live in peace and joy and love. I remember not growing up in the church and uh, I remember the day that God came to me and I can I can stand up here and give my testimony for hours and I'm just a regular guy I look back on my life and I see where God uh, saw, uh, came into my life and I saw, see where he's brought me to this day and how he's transformed me and I, he can do that for anyone if he could do that for me he can do that for anyone no matter who they are I'm just a regular God. That I said yes to God and He took me on this journey. Just like Paul, who was just a fisherman. Like Peter. Like, uh, I mean, excuse me, Peter was just a fisherman. Like Thomas. Like Philip. Like Matthew. All regular guys that said yes to Jesus. And said, yes, you are my Lord. And look but they've accomplished 2.5 billion believers today from 12 to that. It's amazing what God can do with a life no matter where you are in that life. No matter how dark your sin is, He can wash it white as snow. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Father, we pray be the Lord of our life. Be the Lord of our hearts, of our minds, and every area of our life. Help us to prepare our hearts and minds for your coming on the day that you come, whatever day that may be. Help us to share you with those around us that they may come to a saving knowledge of you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. <clears throat>